Welcome back to What Would You Ask podcast. My next guest, everybody knows her. Everyone knows her. If you're a uh, oh, health not- kitchen fan, <laughs> she, was, she was like the favorite. I mean, come on. It was just like watching her, you go through the whole motions. Like she, she was like kind of reserved and naive and not, I don't know if it was naive, but just kind of reserved. You know, I don't even know if it was shy. She kind of held to herself and da, da, da. And then she came like out of her shell and just kicked ass for about like, I don't know, nine uh, challenges in a row or something with some record, I think. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk to Christina about this because it was amazing run for her. She obviously was on the Fox hit show Hell's Kitchen and she was the winner of her season. And that was, what were you, season three? It was season four season and we finaled in 2008. So it's been a couple of years. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, I had, I had, why do I have two, three and four? It says two, three and four. So I guess the middle one, I know she wasn't in two and I didn't know if it was three or four. We'll cut this out, Christina. Uh, Cause we have, <laughs> have to know the season she was on. I mean, <laughs> what's wrong with you guys? Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, season four winner. You remember it, that she was up against uh, my boy there, uh, La Petroza. Yeah, Petroza. Yeah. Um, and he passed away too, didn't he? Did he pass away? No. Yeah. He did. It was really bad. He he was sick um, for a couple of years, and we chatted kind of in jest. And he needed a, it was a kidney transplant, and I said, "Well, do you, you want one of my kidneys? Our blood types aren't compatible, so that didn't work." But he was like, "Is that like a consolation prize?" <laughs> and I'm like, "No." <laughs> oh uh, but Rose and I. Which Rose and I had the opportunity to collaborate on a lot of projects throughout the past decade after Hell's Kitchen. And I, I can't say that there was a more genuine, friendly, kind person. And oh, so, cool. so his loss, I think, is is deeply felt throughout the Hell's Kitchen family. That's good. I mean, I, I, I felt that from him on the show even. He tried to be kind of straight. They always, always kind of trying to be ethical. I think that's how he came across, at least my voice. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the voice you're hearing is of Christina McAmer, the winner of season four from Hell's Kitchen. And we're going to go through the journey with her. I want to find out what the audition process was like and what, you know, what inspired her to motivated her to get on to the kitchen and go through all the hell. And then want to hear what she thinks about the screaming and yelling of Mr. Ramsey, which, you know, this guy's a pro. I mean, if you're going to learn from anybody. He, 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 Gordon Ramsay has nothing when it comes to screaming and yelling against my son. He is louder and he can carry on for much longer. <laughs> That's so good. So let's jump <laughs> no. right in, Christine. That's so good. Perfect. Um, um, tell us a little bit about the audition process. What the, sure. that, how did you inspire yeah. you, motivate you? Go ahead. I mean, nothing inspired me. I was hungry. Yeah. Uh, so I was in culinary school at the time. Um, and I went to the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park, New York, so just right. north of Manhattan. Yeah. And there was an open casting call, and I think it said that there was free lunch. So really, that was my expectation, was that I was going to go to Manhattan and wait in line for six hours and, you know, have a sandwich and a beer with a bunch of other people who, you know, maybe have a screw loose and want to be on this show. And so I did. I think it was like number 400 and something. Um, you fill out a huge application that has a bunch of questions and then you have a 30 second interview. Um, and I went through twins talent based in Manhattan, which by the way, like Manhattan women are fierce anyways, let alone when there's two of them. So they flip open my application and there's a question that says, uh, what do people who don't like you say about you? And of course, my answer is, is about this long. And it starts with know-it-all narcissistic bitch. And they said, well, this is great. What do people that like you say about you? And I said, hopefully the same damn thing. Right. Um, so from there, you do uh, uh, on camera something that's filmed and, and hopefully you do well enough to go to the finals and uh, make sure that you're of sound mind and health. And uh, then you're on. And from, you know, really honestly, from uh, the open casting call to the time that we start filming, it's a very quick process. So it's a little surreal. How do you prepare? So you, you end up getting on. They tell you you're going to be on. 
what is there any preparation do you have to should you try to go through and cook the different stations i mean you're a professional and I mean, you're a student at the time right so so is there any way to prepare for going to hell's kitchen um no <laughs> yes i don't know the answer to that uh i was lucky uh, today if I, I had the same opportunity i don't think i would fare as well because i have responsibilities i have a company and a husband and a baby and a dog and leaving all of that would be really hard um, but culinary school put me in a unique opportunity to succeed in that I really didn't have a lot of responsibility. I was the resident advisor. I was 24 or five. I don't remember, honestly, when we filmed. And I was the resident advisor in the underage dorm. So think about like kids fresh out of high school coming to culinary school and they're drunk, they're experimenting with drugs, they're locked out of their room at three in the morning, they don't know if they identify as being a, a man or a woman. And mm. so I had 453 crazy people. Oh my God. And then I only had to deal with 15 while we were on set and we had a hot tub. So this was a, a quality of life improvement for me. <laughs> um, one thing that I would say is it's really hard uh, filming one of these shows because you're sequestered. So you don't have your, your support group. You can't come home at the end of the day and bitch and cry to your significant other about things that went wrong or listen to music or do a lot of the things that you would normally do to kind of digest and download. Um, the other thing that I think they don't talk about is uh, you don't get recipes. So for the dishes that are on the menu, Gordon will give you a recipe and it may be in metric, it may be in standard, so hopefully mm. you can convert. Uh, but when we're coming up as contestants with all these dishes that we're doing, um, ice creams or pate shoes or pasta dough, you need to know all of that rote. Uh, they're not gonna give you like the joy of cooking so yeah. that you could do a signature dish. That's a good so point. I think coming from culinary school put me in a unique position because I was learning these formulas every day and they were all fresh and top of mind. Um, even in the finale, uh, Petroza and I compared our menus after they were written and we both had patachou, we were both doing profiteroles and we're like, okay, but do you remember the recipe? Like, I think it's this and this and this. And so um, I think that those, that's what you can do to prepare. I mean, you can watch all the seasons, right? That's gonna be helpful. Yeah. You really need to know how to cook risotto. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, that is for sure. It, it's not so much about cooking, I think, because I don't know if I was even the best chef on my season. I'm certainly not the best chef today, uh, but I'm, I'm a really, really good strategic planner. And I'm always looking for the angle. I'm always looking for the challenge. And I'm always thinking kind of three moves ahead. And so I think that that has done well in life. <laughs> <laughs> and reality television. So that's what I would, I guess, the advice in a nutshell. So tell us about your, so you get there, what was the weeks like, if you remember? We, we see, you know, week after week, we see kind of a new day and then we see kind of, or maybe two days where you're doing a service and the next day is a challenge and then a reward, something like that. Um, but tell us how, were you on five days a week? You know, tell us a little bit about how the schedule went. The schedule is grueling. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think television, uh, most of all, time is money, right? So right. we want to shoot as much as we can in, in as little amount of time as we can. Um, so, like, when you watch the show and you see, hey, you have 15 minutes to go up and shower and change, you actually have 15 minutes. There's three showers and 15 contestants. Oh, Do the math. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's things that, that are, are, are emotionally troubling. You're not sleeping. Like when they come in with pans at four in the morning, they're coming in banging pots and pans at four in the morning. You might have had four hours of sleep. And so when you see as, as contestants, as, as the show goes on, having mental breakdowns, it, it's because it's real. It's very agonizing. Um, it's probably one of the most physically brutal things that I've ever gone through. Uh, I lost like 20 pounds in the filming. Wow. It was, it was a great diet. <laughs> I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, but you're constantly like working. You're up and you're, you're energetic and you're prepping and you're not, you know, shoving your face full of French fries every minute as we have been maybe in this quarantine. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so the schedule's tough. Got it. Really tough. When was the first time you actually, were, what we saw on TV, was that the first time everyone meets Gordon Ramsay when he comes out and tells you to do your 
signature dish kind of thing? Yes, that's the first time we meet Gordon Ramsay. Although my season was a little bit different. If you watch the first episode, um, they put us on a bus yeah. to take us to Hell's Kitchen, right. and they have Gordon Ramsay in disguise. Guys, yeah. So you had the black Gordon look, Ramsay on luckily, that bus too, right? Like, I was a little shocked. Yeah. Black Gordon Ramsay, the four-star general, crimes yeah. in his hat. Everybody's talking shit, and he's sitting right there. Yeah. So this is one time, like my mouth didn't get me in trouble, which is great. Um, and then you meet him, and you know Gordon Ramsay's like six foot three, plus his hair adds another three inches. Yeah. Uh, so he's got like a foot and a half on me, and it's like meeting a cartoon, you know, because you see somebody so much on television, then you meet them in person. It's like, wow, that's that's surreal. So yeah, it's the first moment that that everybody gets to meet him. Tell us a little bit about him. I mean, you know him well. You've been part of the Hell's Kitchen family for a long time. Um, and just tell us about him. Sure. Uh, I think the one question that every interviewer has asked me is, what is Gordon Ramsay like in real life? God, he yells at you. That must be terrible. Um, and, you know, the thing that I would say is any professional chef knows that every chef is like that. We are all intense. We don't do this because you make money. We do this because we love it and we're passionate. And so I think the the way that you see chef react on the show, now while he might be a lot funnier than uh, everyday chefs, is honestly the way we all are. Um, but in a professional kitchen, you don't screw up as much <laughs> as you do on the show, so you don't get yelled at. Um, and I would say that Chef Ramsay here's what I loved about him. And it, it's really hard to communicate this if you're not somebody that's like super passionate and, and does this for a living. He would cook some dishes uh, as a demonstration while we were on the show and also when I worked for him in his kitchen. And you watch his feet and they never leave the spot he's in. He has all of his mise en place set up and he just pivots his body. He doesn't have to move his feet. He does everything very delicately. I watched him cook an entire meal with a teaspoon. And these are things that as a professional chef, you look at him and you're like, wow, that's finesse. That's like when you're really, really good at your craft, you can do that. And so um, I guess that's what I would say about yeah. chef. I mean, he's really good at craft. He's fucking hilarious. Yeah. Like, he is. Um, and he's not that mean, you know, I mean, do, do Marines say, oh, my drill sergeant was so mean, he yelled at me. <laughs> no, I mean, do better. And if that's not the life you want to lead, this is probably not a good job. You're not going to make money. You aren't going to have benefits. You're going to work every holiday. That's You're right. going to burn yourself, cut yourself. Go do something else. Be an accountant. <laughs> so I want to get in some of the questions from our members. They sent a bunch okay, of months cool. to announce you were going to be on the show. So Love I'm going to go to... Uh, Ashley from Scottsdale, Arizona wants to know your favorite and least favorite challenge. Well, she won most of them. I mean, she probably oh, like on the show. Gosh, that's really hard. Um, okay. So my least favorite challenge, there was one episode, it, I think it was like a 20 ingredient challenge. There were four of us. I think this is when Matthew cut, Maddie cut his finger off, mm -hmm. uh, into mm -hmm. the pan. Chat. And it went and into so the pan. Yeah. Had, like, ingredients to work with. And Matt has like, Quail, arugula, parmesan, uh, balsamic, like all things that make sense. Um, and I had egg, bell pepper, crab, anchovy, and some of the other shit no one else wanted to take. <laughs> um, and so that was probably my least favorite challenge because it's really hard to make something with bell pepper and yeah. anchovy and an yeah. egg. Um, but we won. So, you know, yeah. there's that. I think, uh, God, my favorite challenge. Oh, I don't know what it would be, um, but I know my favorite reward was our spa day because they're just so oh beaten God. down. Yeah. Uh, I know I talked earlier about having uh, some something to like decompress and de-stress and how you don't have that on the show. Um, and that like our spa day was enough for us to kind of start to put ourselves back together. I think we might have lost service that night, so maybe it wasn't the best reward for us, but that was probably my favorite. My favorite challenge, I have two of them, and I want to get your feedback on this. The taste okay. testing, I think, is can be telling. I don't really put a lot of stock in it, whether, you know, a chef, because I don't, I don't know, you know, somebody said, I, ha I just had a cigarette and a Coke, and I didn't know we were going to do this. 
And then right when I heard we were going to do this, I put a lifesaver in my mouth. And he said, and this was on the show, I think it was season six. He says, I wish I did none of those three things because yeah, he, it was terrible, right? And, and But he didn't know that that was upcoming. But it's so cool to see you guys with blindfolds on and he's feeding you, you know, it could be anything. It could be a tangerine and you have to figure it out. And I don't even know what a leak is, but for people to guess what a, I mean, to say it's, it's a leak. I mean, it's like, what? I don't, it, it's amazing to me. I mean, just some of the things. And then the other one that's really my, this is my overall favorite is when Gordon cooks and you have to recreate the dish with, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and you're knowing what's in the, and I know there's different names for this stuff, but what's what you use for the sauce and the ingredients and wait, there's something sweet in there. What is that sweetness? And I have to find it. And you're, how you guys pick that stuff apart to me is, you know, my wife will feed me something and say, is that bitter? And I'm like, yeah, a little bit. I don't even know what bitter, I don't know what, I don't have great taste buds. I don't, I mean, I can tell when something's sweet, but all right, unless it's really bitter, like a, you know, I don't know. I don't, it's amazing. Tell me about what your thoughts on those two challenges. Okay. Well, I mean, it's a little unfair. Uh, since Hell's Kitchen, I became a certified sommelier, um, yeah. which yeah. is a piece of paper that says that I'm a professional wino. Uh, and it, it requires me to be able to identify a lot of flavors and nuances. Like, you know us like creepy songs because we're the ones at the garden store smelling the rocks so that we know the difference between like, you know, granite and limestone. Uh, so this challenge is not necessarily fair. Um, and so one way that I'd like to frame it, because I think I hear the opposite, like where you said you're impressed that we can identify a leak. I oftentimes hear like, how did you know that that was shrimp or whatever the hell it was? Um, so you're wearing headphones, right? Yep. Yep. And they're playing some kind of loud death metal. Oh, no idea what it is, but you cannot think. Um, and you're getting bites of things. You don't get to smell it ahead of time. And that's where a lot of our ability to identify things comes yeah. from. And none of it is in the right like shape or consistency. So I know in my season I had radish, but it was like pulverized, overcooked mush that you're, you, you know, you're, you're, you're masticating it in your mouth. You're chewing it up and you're like, God, it's like radish, but overcooked. Yeah. And you're like, yes, of course, it's radish. Uh, so, yes, it's a really, really hard challenge. Um, the show doesn't make it any easier. Uh, but I think as chefs, and, and certainly those of us that have pursued other talents, uh, we taste a lot of foods, you know? So maybe the average person off the street doesn't know the difference between arugula and radicchio, but mm-hmm. we're tasting this all the time. So mm-hmm. it, it should be a little bit easier. Um, the taste it, then make it challenge. That was the other one. Uh, I don't know if you've watched my episode for that. Good. I was trying to figure out, like, I, I, I knew that the set had mirepoix, but it, it had a binder and I didn't know what it was. And my, I think my mom said like 13 or 14 times it's cream. Yeah. She and did. I just went a little wrong. Like, listen to your mother. She yeah. knows. Like, you did not use yeah. cream, right? No, <laughs> no. I tried to use aioli and broke and it was disgusting that I didn't know I was just a baby chef at the time uh but here's the thing about that challenge that's really really hard like you know on this dish that that there's white bean puree right so we go to the walk-in and none of these ingredients exist prior to this challenge you open the walk-in and there's 12 different kinds of white beans and you're like what the fuck I didn't know there were 12 (laughs) different kinds of white beans to begin with let alone if it's like navy beans or flagellet or cannellini and so you use your best bet or best guess. I, I think on that challenge, I actually cooked two or three different kinds of white beans so that I could puree them and then go, okay, this is it. Um, but it's, it's really, really tough. You know, like you have to look, I don't even know. I think we had venison loin or something. Yeah. I'm from yeah. Missouri. I don't know anything about venison loin. <laughs> and when you, when you open your walk-in, there's uh, bison, venison, elk. Who the fuck knows what uh, elk is like? Yeah. You know, and so you have to really like use your strategic brain to get to the answer. So uh, neither challenge is easy. Tyler from Staten Island, New York. Tyler wants to know, uh, this is an interesting question. Are, okay. are the chefs required to shift stations during service? That's an interesting question. And it's great. He put in parentheses, 
if I'm good at meat, why would I not just always cook meat? Is there a requirement around that? It's a good question. Yeah, so um, station assignments are done by chef prior to service. So you could probably see when you're watching the episode, or I don't know if they edit that out. I'm not sure. Um, but you don't have a choice about what station oh, you're okay. going to I don't see. I didn't see a lot of chef saying that you go to, you know, meet. It's only on like certain episodes. Like if, okay. if you and I collaborate on a menu, then a lot of times you can pick your station, but you don't have a choice. And if you're not doing well, say on fish station, chef may pull you out and put somebody else in. Right. So a lot of times you're going to be doing all the mise en place for meat station. You know what's there, how it's set up, how the cuts are, what needs to move first, but you're gonna go work fish now and you're at the mercy of whoever set that up. Um, so that could be a big challenge. I will say uh, on our first night as a red team, we all sat down and we talked about what we were good and what we were bad at. And I was like, well, you know, I'm really, I'm really terrible at cooking pastry, but I'm awesome. Like I will kill it on meat station. And wouldn't you know it, the next day I was on pastry station. I mean, who would have thought? Um, and I, I, I said that knowing full well I was terrible at the meat station and killed it on pastry. So, <laughs> you know, one is that's the strategic part there. That's funny. Uh, April from Venice Beach, California wants to know how much is the elimination uh, based on personal friendship and not cooking? That's an interesting question. Did you find, um, I, was, you know, I love that question. I think one of the interesting dynamics of Hell's Kitchen as a show is that it's your fellow chefs putting you up for elimination. And so that creates a lot of drama and mm -hmm. tension. Uh, ultimately, chef is going to be the one, you know, that sends you home or keeps you there. So that's the person you have to impress. But I think on my season, especially, you see a lot of this interplay. I think it was episode two that Corey put. Jen up for personal reasons because she didn't like her. That's right. Shocker. Yeah. Uh, and she put me up for strategic reasons, which I don't blame her. I mean, Corey yeah. and I, I think we're the best two girls on the team. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of that plays in. I, I know when I was making decisions personally, there were people but at the beginning of the show, I really didn't like Corey. I hated her. Um, but we cook so well together. <laughs> I, I you did. You did work together is what really ultimately brought us together and I have so much respect for her. Uh, but in the beginning, I wanted every opportunity to send her home. But at the end of the day, I can't, that's not a fair decision to make. Um, so I think that I would tell future contestants to consider that. Like this is a job interview, right? Yeah. You're not gonna like everybody that you have to work with, but you need to make a fair and honest decision. That's awesome. Um, John from, what does that say? I think it says Jacksonville. Jacksonville, Florida wants to know if there's any funny antidotes, antidotes or memorable moments uh, that were left on the edit room floor that you remember. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things that were left. I mean, you know, you have to consider the breadth of footage that they have yeah. versus, you know, the 30 minutes or 45 minutes you get to see. Um, one thing that I thought was really cool was uh, at, at one point towards the end of the, the season, Matt gets moved over to the red team. And I think we convinced Jen to go over to the blue team. That was all our idea. Uh, and so Matt and I are sitting down on the patio and we're like, look, you don't have any friends on the red team. Then I don't have any friends on the red team. So maybe we should be each other's friend. We should have a little alliance. And I think that lasted like all of a day. <laughs> Um, you know, but there's things like that, that, that yeah. happened that are, you know, kind of weird. There was, uh, a challenge that Corey and I had to do. It was after, you know, episode two and she puts me up for elimination. The next day the girls lose the challenge. And so of course, Corey and I have to like team up to do whatever the punishment is. And that's when we actually started to talk and kind of, you know, realize that we don't really want to be enemies, but you don't see that either. So. There, there's little interplays that go on with, yeah. with all the chefs. So tell us a little bit about the finale. And um, you had a lot of confidence. Petroza had a lot of confidence, as both of you should. Um, where do you think you won it? Was it the, the team? Was it your cooking? Was it how you handled the pass? Tell us a little bit about, I mean, you were the favorite. You were killing it at the end. I mean, but Petroza was like the sleeper. You know, you, it wouldn't have been shocking if he really stepped up 
during his service uh, that he won either. I think, but you were the odds-on favorite. Tell us what you think pushed you over the edge to win Hell's Kitchen. Well, I think Petroza, so Petroza actually graduated from the Culinary Institute as well, 25 years before, before me. You, yeah. Um, and he had a lot of experience. He had a solid skill set. He was really good at what he did. Um, I was young. I was hungry, yeah. <laughs> as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, again, it's a job interview. Uh, this was a chef to open up Gordon Ramsay's restaurant in West Hollywood, California. Right. And so we were one of the last seasons, I think we were the last season, where you could actually design your own restaurant. Yep. Um, and so I think that, you know, even though I was a little neurotic, sorry, it's what makes me good. Uh, when you looked at the concept of my restaurant, there were floating candles. It was Elliot twilight. We had these mm-hmm. gorgeous satin linens and these suede chairs. And it was what you expect to find in West Hollywood. Um, chef Petroza's restaurant it was brick and flour and big red leather chairs. And it would have been a great steakhouse in New York. Yeah. I was just going to say that. A bit a little bit more with the box that we were trying to fit point. in. Our menus had a lot of similarities. Um, when I was writing my menu and I think I, I actually got some flack from chef for uh, my menu was, was too simple or wasn't taking enough of a risk. And, you know, I was writing my menu throughout the entire season. Like every time I have downtime, I'm writing my final menu so that the, when the day comes, I'm ready. And I'm trying to write a menu that my team can execute. You know, what have we done? What did we do well? I threw a lobster risotto on because Nat had a great lobster risotto. So when thinking about my menu, I want things that they can be invested in, that they feel like they collaborated in and can cook. <laughs> That's important. Right. That is important. Um, and then when it came to running the past, you know, everything wasn't smooth. Um, we had some hiccups for sure. And, you know, Matt tried to send raw monkfish. Monkfish mm-hmm. has to be cooked. Mm-hmm. It's disgusting. There's parasites in there. It's nasty. And he was sending me like raw monkfish, I don't know, three or four times. And it's going to the table with my mother. And isn't it a fish that you can overcook and it'll still be? I read something about monkfish yeah, being, fine. if you're, you're going to overcook any fish. fish. Yeah. Put it in, in the back with the ambient heat. It's good. Right. Right. It's, uh, just, you can't, it's like, you know, chicken. It could be slightly overdone, but don't send it to me raw. You're going to kill somebody. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think being able to, to catch those things before they leave the window, you know, like all the drama that happens in the kitchen. In this case, we're filming. So you yeah. do know about it. But as a guest in a regular restaurant, you don't know until it lands on your table. So tell everybody what you're up to. You mentioned the sommelier and Napa and all that. Tell everybody what you're up to today and how are things going with you? Well, I mean, things I think in the current landscape are always interesting. Uh, I'm doing the pandemic pivot currently. Um, So I was in LA. Um, I opened Gordon's Restaurant in 2008. Um, The next year, I opened Bouchon in Beverly Hills for Thomas Keller. Thomas Keller, yep. Um, and I had this like epiphany one night. I was a poissonnier, I cooked fish. And so you get there in the morning and you butch the fish, butcher the fish, excuse me. And you know, you cook lunch, you take a little break, you cook dinner, you break down, you clean down, you walk into your car and tired, and you steak, fish, steak. Uh, and you know, make $12 an hour, still driving the Ford Focus I had back in culinary school, with three hubcaps. And I was just, reflecting on my life as I see our sommelier Craig in his like, cute little suit walking to his BMW Uh-oh. carrying a case of wine and he had worked all of six hours and I was like god I want to do what you do uh, so while I was in LA I was able to take uh, some wine classes became a certified sommelier but if I really wanted to be serious about wine I had to move to Napa Valley so I had an opportunity in 2011 to move up here um, and help a small wine brand essentially emerge um, and their concept was blended wines because that goes well with food, uh, but they needed a chef to give that concept legitimacy. So I joined on with them. I spent a lot of money designing a beautiful kitchen inside of a tasting room uh, to really kind of hone that food and wine pairing. And so that took five years of my life. 
And wow. since then, I've been working independently. I do some consulting still in the wine industry. Um, it's not my favorite thing. You know, everybody thinks working in the wine industry is glamorous, but no, I'm selling a controlled substance across state lines. There's compliance <laughs> and logistics, and it's not fun. But when there's fires and emergencies here, it's consistent. Uh, plus, it helps me afford great wine. Uh, and then I also work as a personal chef. So the pandemic pivot is a little interesting. I was doing some catering and winery events and things like that, which by the way, there is none of that going on this year. Yeah. Um, so I'm really lucky that I have some clients that live here year round and hate to cook, which is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I can fulfill that need there for them. Um, so rather than doing larger events uh, and things like that, they're doing a lot of entertaining in their homes and uh, their homes are really nice. So my wife, really my wife said to me during the pandemic, we get our wine delivered. I get um, Louis Martini from California. Uh -huh. And yeah. uh, I get, she goes, I think our frequency of cases of wine have increased while we were quarantined. And then like literally the next, and that was back in like April or something, literally the next day there was articles in the New York Post saying mm -hmm. uh, that everybody is drinking, like the alcohol is, consumption is just going Thank through goodness. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we still have a job. And I'll tell you, like our uh, Napa Valley's prime consumer went from men in Texas to moms who have to homeschool. Yeah. You were at home, homeschooling, digital learning. You were drinking a lot more wine and bless your heart for it. So rumors have it. This is my last question to you and I'll let you go. I really do appreciate your time. Um, there is Vegas 19 or 20 season being filmed now or coming out in October or something. It's filmed already. I'm not sure, but I know they've signed on for a couple more years. Mm -hmm. uh, any returns? I know you probably can't tell me, but I'm trying to see it in your eyes. Are you going to head back to the Hell's Kitchen again? Even wow, are, you just, are you judging my poker face right now? That's so <laughs> Maybe a little um, bit. You know, nothing like that I can divulge, obviously. Sure. Um, you know, there, there's trust. And yep. uh, I would say that Fox Network has treated me really well. Yeah. Uh, so if the opportunity arises, I am there. Got it. Well, you have to do, do you ever things. communicate with Gordon? That was a question we yeah. got a bunch. Because you're, you're kind yeah. of like a you do okay that's cool yeah so he's out here all the time um and he, he has some friends uh the beckhams you may know them he played soccer for a while yep uh, they have a house up here so a lot of times after he's done filming he and the family will come up here for a couple of days so as much as i can but i'll tell you like i'm busy he's 10 times busier than yeah. i am <laughs> i bet Listen, thank you so much for your time today. We it's really appreciate pleasure. it. It's been a great time revisiting and listening to the old memories. It was cool watching you on there. And congratulations on all your success, um, personally and professionally. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I've enjoyed it, and I've enjoyed our interview. Have fun yeah. talking to the other members of the Hell's Kitchen family. I will do it. We'll be back with more What Would You Ask podcast in a second. <laughs>